No, it's not over. We keep going and we're going to continue to go forward. We have numerous local cases where, you know, in some of the states that got uh, rigged and robbed from, from us. Uh, we won every one of them. We won Pennsylvania. We won Michigan. Uh, we won Georgia by a lot. Donald Trump continuing to insist that there was massive fraud and that he won the presidential race and vowing to keep on fighting a lost cause. I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. Trump's insistence comes despite the Electoral College affirming Joe Biden's victory, the Supreme Court refusing to hear two Trump challenges, dozens of courts rejecting other Trump lawsuits, with many accompanied by mocking opinions from the judges. His behavior since Election Day has been bizarre. But while his court cases may have been legally ludicrous, have they been politically savvy? Has he cemented his iron grip on the GOP, whether he wants to run again or just be a kingmaker? And what does it all mean for a Biden presidency? Peter Baker is the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times. He's the author, along with wife Susan Glesser, of the bestseller, The Man Who Ran Washington, about James Baker, who played a pivotal role in the 2000 election, Trip Gabriel, a national correspondent for the New York Times, Mark Leibovich, chief national correspondent for the New York Times magazine. Peter, you wrote in this past week that I honestly can't recall two independent events of such extreme importance occurring on the same day. This was the vote of the Electoral College and the first COVID vaccine given in New York City. Now we still have a month, though, before the inauguration. What can we expect from here on in? Is it going to be clear sailing? Yeah, no. <laughs> Let's just start with that. It's not going to be clear sailing. The outcome is foreordained of, at this point. Joe Biden will be inaugurated on January 20th at noon. There's no question about that. But that doesn't mean that the president is going to give up his, his complaining and his railing against the winds. Uh, he has made clear as recently as uh, within the last hour that he does not accept the election, that he thinks that he won, or at least he's arguing that he won. There's zero pr proof of this. Nobody believes it except for him and his blood relatives and, uh, and his followers, but it doesn't mean he will stop making that case. But there is no path forward to stopping the election. Uh, what you see, though, is this rather remarkable moment in our history where a sitting president of the United States is not just trying to challenge an election, but trying to overturn an election, an election by the people. We've never seen anything like that before. A Republican state senator in Virginia who's running for governor just yesterday said he should declare martial law. Uh, you know, Michael Flynn, his former national security advisor, said the thing, same thing. We're in really uncharted territory. But all of this is mostly, store, uh, you know, a lot of sound and fury. It, it will leave the system damaged, but he will leave office on January 20th. Mark, you uh, pointed out that uh, the Republicans could not even get themselves to mention the president-elect by name. Uh, we seem to be a little bit past that now, now that the Electoral College has voted. Uh, but what about the president himself? Is he kidding himself? Is this uh, delusional or is it part of some grand strategy on his part? You know, there, there's been so much um, conversation, so much sort of brain power um, wasted really on trying to figure out what is motivating him at a given moment. I mean, I think clearly there's some maybe real denialism in there. I mean, denial has been, as Peter pointed out the other day, has been like a cornerstone of his political strategy of his public persona since he became president. Um, I think at this point, I mean, it's not a new idea to say that Donald Trump is out primarily for himself. He does not care about the Republican Party. He does not care so much about, you know, the sort of traditional metrics of history. And, um, you know, I, I think it's also from a pure marketing and branding standpoint, this is a way to put himself into the conversation and also solidify himself as whether it's a kingmaker or a viable presidential candidate in 2024, certainly central to all of the action in the Republican Party um, for the immediate future. But I also think to Peter's point, um, the next month or so is going to be a very dicey, you know, couple of you know, weeks, basically, a couple of um, just a dicey period in that you don't know what kind of pardoning is going to go on. You don't know what kind of tumult is going to go on. You don't know what kind of foreign policy things are going to happen. Um, I think right now people are holding their breath to sort of see what this will be like once this per period ends. 
Sure, you pointed out that the Republicans were pretty speechless after the Supreme Court defeats in terms of the election results. Uh, finally, <clears throat> McConnell uh, congratulated President Biden, President-elect Biden, and uh, his running mate. Uh, has he made it clear that, uh, as with the Obama presidency, he intends to make uh, Joe Biden or whoever the Democrats uh, uh, put up for the next one or two or whatever number of terms, a one-term president? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, the, the there are a lot of storm clouds over this election. And I think that uh, as, as hopeful as many Americans are, and particularly most Democrats are, that a page will be turned. I, I think the evidence is pretty clear that uh, we're going to be um, drawn ceaselessly back into the past, you know, to quote uh, Fitzgerald. Uh, we will be seeing a lot of obstruction for in, in, in Congress, and we will be seeing a lot of, you know, denial and resistance among uh, Republican-based voters. We're not a small percentage of, of the electorate. Trump won, you know, 70-odd million uh, votes. We have two pretty uh, interesting milestones coming up uh, early next, next month. We have an election in Georgia for control of the Senate, the first uh, uh, election, uh, important election in which uh, Donald Trump will not be on the ballot, so we'll have a real test of... Uh, turnout uh, in, 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 the, in the Georgia Senate races. And um, on January 6th, uh, Congress in joint session uh, meets to accept the uh, sort of formally ratify the uh, results of the Electoral College. And uh, there could be a lot of, um, a lot of mischief uh, perpetrated by, by Republicans, uh, you know, under, under various scenarios. And uh, some of them who are the bitter enders kind of clinging to uh, Trump's perception that uh, uh, that Biden did not win uh, and, and have aspirations for um, the future, uh, their futures in their states, places like Pennsylvania, you know, uh, could, and, and the senator from uh, Wisconsin, Ron Johnson, who's also up for re-election, there could be some mischief, you know. Uh, Maybe mischief in terms of grandstanding, but uh, uh, Mark, uh, is there likely to be anything uh, substantive, as you pointed out, uh, with uh, Rudy Giuliani as the lawyer, the legal team uh, so far since the election seems to have set a precedent for lowering the bar uh, in terms of uh, how they've handled legal challenges to this election. Yeah, I mean, legally, I mean, this issue is settled, basically. I mean, in, in the Electoral College, um, we'll settle it in a very formal way going forward. Um, I do think that you know, the question is, how do you define substantively at this point, right? I mean, a great deal of Donald Trump's presidency has not been about substance. It's been about theatrics. It's been about um, just basically marketing and noise and some very, very dangerous themes around it. Um, and I think that that you would argue if you were advising Ted Cruz, say the senator from Texas, or Josh Hawley, the senator from Missouri, both who are thinking about running for president in 24, you could make an argument to them that like, hey, whether it's substantive or not, if you were to make a fuss on the floor of the U.S. Senate when the electoral votes are being counted, um, it could probably win you some real goodwill among caucus voters in Iowa or ab among Trump supporters wherever or Donald Trump himself. So, I mean, that's sort of what passes for substance in the minds of a lot of politicians, people who probably know better in their own minds and who are probably substantively very capable, um, you know, in, in different realms. But that's sort of how we look at this now. But no, as far as a legal precedent goes, there is really nothing getting in the way between Joe Biden and inauguration day. Peter, we've seen a lot of comings and goings uh, over the past four years in the Trump cabinet, of course. Uh, we now have a glimpse, uh, a fairly good glimpse of what the Biden cabinet is going to look like. What does it tell us uh, at this point, this early stage, about uh, what his administration is likely to be? Well, a, a couple of thoughts. One is, of course, you're seeing in many of these picks uh, a resurrection of the Biden-Obama team, right? Biden is putting together a lot of the people he's been uh, close to for years and decades. He can be surrounded by people he knows and feels very comfortable with. It seemed to be one of the defining uh, factors in his choice, for instance, of General Lloyd Austin uh, to be Secretary of Defense instead of Michelle Fornoy, who everybody thought was going to get the job. Everybody uh, uh, you know, has a lot of respect for Michelle Fornoy, but it seems like the president-elect is more personally comfortable with Lloyd Austin and and chose him in part because of that. The other thing I think you're seeing in terms of these choices, of course, is, is the, the fragility and the complicated nature of the Biden coalition. 
So now that Trump is receding as a unifying force for the people who uh, supported Biden, you see him now trying to navigate the pretty complicated shoals of, of, of his side of the equation between liberals and moderates and, and identity politics. And we've got to make sure the cabinet has enough of these and, and some of those. Uh, all of whom, uh, you know, are, are, you know, are probably very qualified, but you can see in Biden's picks, you know, a desire to not just make his cabinet look like America, to use the phrase Bill Clinton uh, coined back in the 90s, but to make sure he's satisfying different parts of his coalition, whether it be uh, ethnic uh, groups, whether it be uh, gender balance, whether it be labor, whether it be liberals, environmentalists, he's got a whole lot of different parts of that coalition to try to to, to, to reach out to. And you already see the, the complaining, of course, by various por portions of that coalition that feel like they haven't got enough, that there aren't you know, people who take our point of view on this issue or who look like us uh, you know, in some other way. And I think it's a complicated uh, scenario he's looking at that, uh, that you didn't really see with Trump. Trump simply picked people that he liked who, quote, out of central casting, that was the phrase he used. Biden is trying to manage this very, uh, you know, multi-layered, multi-faceted coalition in the, in the picking of his team. Tripp, you mentioned uh, the Georgia runoffs uh, coming up early in January. Uh, one of the things that was striking, as you pointed out, in the November election is that uh, Democrats uh, did not do all that well in the down-ballot races. Uh, so what does that say about uh, what the likelihood is, how they will do in the Georgia runoffs? Uh, we've had both uh, Biden and Trump campaigning there for the respective candidates. Uh, what's the likely result going to be? Sam, if I knew what the likely result was going to be, I would uh, be a very rich man on, uh, on January uh, 6th, I guess, the next uh, the day after Election Day. Um, but you're absolutely right. You know, Biden's victory was not as sweeping as many Democrats had hoped. Trump lost by 7 million votes, but Biden carried uh, three of the most crucial uh, swing states that got him over the top in the Electoral College by uh, fewer than 45,000 votes, uh, Georgia being one of them, Arizona and Wisconsin the other two. Uh, the down ballot losses for Democrats, you know, in this election in, in, in the House where, uh, uh, where Republicans flipped, I think, a net of about 10 seats and, and, and even more uh, strikingly in state legislatures where Republicans are going to keep control uh, into, the next, uh, in, in, into the next cycle at least. Um, are really a, a, a strong uh, sign of, um, you know, where the Democrats' challenges are going forward. So, uh, you know, I think what will be most telling in Georgia is, 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 is turnout. I mean, both uh, Trump and Biden, you know, had extraordinary turnout in this last election um, and, you know, pretty much driven by, uh, you know, by the divisiveness of, the, of, of Donald Trump. So without him, I mean, Georgia has been a, a Republican uh, state in, in statewide elections until this year uh, in recent history. So I don't know what's going to happen. I think that uh, it's, it's, there's definitely a strong, you know, contest and, you know, both, uh, both parties have a shot. Peter, Bill Barr pushed, jumped, and why at this point? Yes, uh, both, I think. Uh, I think he was, uh, you, you can't push me because I'm jumping. Uh, you know, you can't fire me, I'm quitting. Uh, you know, look, there was a lot of uh, tension there in these last few weeks, which is pretty ironic because Bill Barr has been, the way Donald Trump calls him, my Roy Cohn for most of his tenure. He was very, uh, uh, you know, supportive of the president's position on a lot of these things. He helped frame the Mueller report in the most advantageous light to the president. He let uh, Michael Flynn, he tried to overturn the guilty pleas for the president's uh, former national security advisor, Michael Flynn. He tried to reduce the sentence for Roger Stone, the president's friend. He, he has framed issues repeatedly in terms of the Russia investigation in the way that Trump would frame them. And, but in these last few weeks, in Trump's view, he let him down. He refused to go after Biden or Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama in an investigative way prior to the election as the president repeatedly pressed him to do in public. Uh, after the election, he said, look, I don't see widespread fraud that would have overturned the election, directly contradicting the president of the United States, his effort to try to overturn this election in a very damaging way. And then, of course, there was the revelation of this tax investigation into Hunter Biden that the attorney general uh, knew about but didn't publicly disclose before the election per normal 
procedures, by the way, that's not something you're supposed to do. Bill Barr followed the normal procedures, but the president wanted him to have put it out before the election in order to damage Joe Biden is mad at Barr that he didn't do it. So they had a parting of the ways. It's just three weeks before the inauguration, but it is telling that they couldn't even last for these last three weeks. Whether that changes, you know, Bill Barr's, you know, legacy in the end, I don't know. It's going to be a complicated story, uh, but it does remind us that this is a president who is outgoing, who cared about the Justice Department entirely for what it will do for him uh, in terms of protecting his friends and going after his enemies. Mark, uh, last question, if I can. Uh, we heard a lot about the inauguration, the crowd that attended it uh, four years ago when Donald Trump was first sworn in. Uh, what are the uh, the uh, protocols of a president pending his successor's inauguration? What can we expect Donald Trump to do on Inauguration Day, January 2021? Yeah, well, I mean, the notion of Donald Trump and protocol in the same sentence over the last four years has, has shown us the folly of trying to predict such things. So, um, you know, I, it wouldn't surprise me if he didn't show up. It also wouldn't surprise me if he surprised everyone and showed up and everyone focused on him and so forth. I think, you know, like the pretty much everything in, in this campaign cycle, um, the Biden people are, are planning some kind of virtual thing. It's going to be a very scaled down affair as far as what we will see at the Capitol. Um, I don't think people will focusing, be focusing as much on crowd size or anything. Um, <clears throat> so it's going to be, it's not going to be a spectacle in the way that anyone um, would expect. And if Donald Trump were being inaugurated, it would obviously be 180 degrees different. But I do think that, yeah, I think it's pretty evident that Donald Trump will make himself part of this story on January 20th. There's no question. Yes. Thanks to Peter Baker, Trip Gabriel, and Mark Leibovich of the New York Times. And coming up next, handicapping next year's mayoral race. Twenty twenty one will be Bill de Blasio's last year as mayor. The list of announced or likely candidates to succeed him is already long and growing almost by the day. A business group, Common Sense NYC, has already raised over a million dollars to try and influence the race and expects to raise a lot more. It's an independent expenditure committee, so it can't coordinate with a specific candidate or campaign. But as the Times reports, quotes, business leaders in New York have long been frustrated with Mayor de Blasio and have been looking for a more business-friendly candidate to support. So how should we handicap the race so early in the process? We're joined by Jeff Mays, who's a Metro politics reporter for the Times. And Jeff, it's really striking that even at this stage of the campaign, the number of what you might call non-traditional candidates who are contemplating the race. Andrew Yang, Catherine Garcia, Sean Donovan, Raymond McGuire, Maya Wiley. Why is that? Uh, is it because of uh, the fact that there's public financing? Is it the fact that at this point we're looking at uh, uh, ranking voting? Uh, why are so many people thinking of getting into a race that uh, for a job that's got to be awfully difficult for the coming four years? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is one of those watershed moments in New York City. It's it's similar to 2013 when you've we've had three Bloomberg terms. Uh, the city was dissatisfied with how some things were going, and there was an opportunity to make a real turn, a real change in how the city operated. And I think we have the same thing now because of the coronavirus pandemic, in addition to the massive deficits that the city is facing. You know, a lot of people see that there's a real opportunity to kind of put their stamp on the city. And on top of that, there's no leading candidate right now. You know, you have a a bunch of uh, names and, and big names, people who are, are going to get in, like Andrew Yang uh, recently uh, is likely to get into the race. But I think it's wide open. And so, you know, people sense opportunity here to make their case to the voters. There's no incumbent. Uh, and you can argue that, you know, the argument is going to be that they want to go in a different direction uh, than Mayor de Blasio did. So, I think that's why so many people are jumping in right now. It's pretty unusual for a non-politician in the broadest sense, a non-public official, uh, elected official to actually become mayor. You look back, and of course, there was Rudy Giuliani, who was a federal prosecutor, 
Mike Bloomberg, who spending tens and tens of millions of dollars probably would have lost the election had it not been for 9-11. And yet you've got these other people coming in, all of whom may be totally competent. Andrew Yang, who has some national prominence and a fair amount of money, uh, and yet still uh, awful lot of handicaps to overcome to win a race in a Democratic primary in New York City. So how do we handicap a race like this with so many people and, uh, as you say, so many kind of established candidates, as Scott Stringer, who's been around for a long time and is the incumbent uh, controller, uh, and yet, uh, again, as you say, no actual leading uh, front runner at this point. Yeah, I think it's going to be the candidate that can really find that sweet spot between the the major issues facing the city right now. So, you know, the future of the city, the economy is a huge issue. You mentioned how the business community is very anxious about who's going to be the next mayor. They're looking for someone that they can work with. But at the same time, you know, the city, like the rest of the country, saw these protests this spring and this summer about racial justice, about discriminatory policing. So I think there's going to be a a push from these candidates to say, you know, I'm the person who can do both. I can address the issue of racial injustice in our country and in our city. Uh, You know, things like a lack of minority contracting and how uh, there is disparity in police arrests uh, for low-level crimes, for example. But at the same time, I can work with the business community I can work with Washington, and even I can work with Governor Cuomo to make the city a much better place. And I think the person that makes that argument best to voters uh, is going to have a good head start in this race. Of course, it's awfully early, uh, even though the Democratic primary will probably be in June, uh, and assuming, of course, that the Democratic uh, primary winner uh, will be tantamount to election, uh, which is often the case. Uh, but uh, is there anything that makes any of these people stand out at this point, or are they all fairly the same in terms of their positions, uh, their background, uh, their ideology? No, I think you know they're starting to differentiate themselves. Uh, I think in, in a, someone like a Ray McGuire, who was a, a Wall Street executive, you know, his argument is that you know I've dealt with billion-dollar deals, billion-dollar billion acquisitions. I can be a good leader. You know, there have been questions about uh, Mayor de Blasio's leadership during this uh, coronavirus pandemic. He's faced some criticisms uh, for uh, how decisions have been made. So you have someone like a Ray McGuire saying, I can come in, I can make these strong decisions. Um, you know, I am a good leader. But then you have someone like a Maya Wally saying, look at my civil rights background. You know, I can address uh, a lot of these issues dealing with civil rights. But at the same time, I've been in government. You know, I, I understand how government works. And then you have a, a Scott Stringer, you know, his, one of his slogans has been, he's gonna manage the hell out of the city. Uh, and I think, you know, there have been concerns about how the city's man, been managed over the past few years. And so that argument uh, could be a strong one with voters. And the fact, you know, coming in that he and Eric Adams have government experience, you know, they're, they're not gonna be new to how government operates and the rules. Um, so I think those are some of the, the key uh, things you're going to see candidates argue. Uh, and then someone like Andrew Yang is going to say, look, I'm an outsider. I'm coming in. I have new ideas, fresh ideas for city government. So it's going to be a question of, of what the voters see as the sort of best, best path forward. Jeff, this is a totally unfair question to ask you to answer quickly, uh, but ranked voting. Uh, people thought this was a great reform. Now there are questions about it. Why? There are a group of council members, the uh, members of the Black Latino Asian Caucus, who feel that ranked choice voting may actually uh, disenfranchise some voters of color, in their words. Uh, they feel like there hasn't been a, a proper education campaign. Uh, the Board of Elections have had issues uh, in the past in terms of absentee ballots, keeping up uh, with the electorate, um, educating the electorate. So the argument, they actually filed a lawsuit last week uh, saying that there isn't enough time to educate voters. Voters will be disenfranchised. So they want to hold off on implementing ranked choice voting. Uh, Whether they'll be successful or not is unclear. Uh, But there has been strong pushback against that. A lot of people like ranked choice voting. They think it'll equalize the election, change the way and change the way campaigns are run for the better. 
And uh, obviously will have an enormous effect on what the outcome will be with so many candidates running and so many candidates becoming eligible uh, for public financing. Although, as you pointed out, uh, so far, Scott Stringer was the only mayoral candidate who uh, proved to be eligible. Jeff Mays of the New York Times, thank you so much for joining us. And for the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.